Welcome to the Be Awesome Show. I am so excited for this. Uh, Mate, it's amazing to have you. Who better guest could we have than uh, Mr. Gratitude, Chris Shembra? Holy shit. You know, this is, we're we're excited. We're nervous at the same time. Like, you know, you're you're a big name in gratitude right now, all over the world. I think Steve Napolitan is bigger in gratitude than me, but uh, at least I got gratitude and pasta. (laughs) Exactly. You've got an extra bit that goes with it. I mean, my my goal is, you know, by by April of 2022, yeah. our goal is to be globally recognized experts in the concepts of gratitude. Mm, which uh, is... I, I think we're well on our way. I think we've done a wonderful, wonderful job, but we haven't even begun. That's the fun thing about all of us being so young on this call. We haven't even begun, huh? No, there's uh, there's so much more that we can do. And that's one thing that I've been um, really honing in on lately is, you know, where is our edge? And, you know, by, by you know, what I'm meaning by where is our edge is how far can we go with all these sort of things? How far can you go with gratitude? How many people can you reach? How many people's lives can you change? And, you know, so far you've you've done gratitude sessions with like over 400,000 people, yeah? It's a, it's a, it's a good thing. I mean, the scale of gratitude is, I mean, I can't wait for the first Broadway play to come out about gratitude. Or the first <laughs> tea. Actually, we, we, we just had dinner with a, a big uh, production company here in America about uh, doing a television show about us. Wow. We, we signed, we signed a deal at the start of COVID, mm. uh, a big multi-million dollar TV deal at the start of COVID. And then, you know, everybody, it was signed. The contract was signed April 12th. Yeah. And so we were a month into, I mean, technically the contract, it started signing before COVID, but then it was finally signed April 12th. And we're sitting there saying, shit, there goes that opportunity. Mm. We yeah. literally, literally, so we had to wait for the nine month uh, contract to go out so that we could now sign with uh, Star Media. That's incredible. And, uh, so we'll see if we can scale. They, they, their things get about, their things get about a billion views a year. Wow. That is huge. That is huge. So for people who are tuning in, um, it's, you know, the gratitude experience. We've done two sessions with you, Mark, and I've done two sessions with you so far. And we've got another one coming up in a week. Next a week's week. Time, next week, which we're all super excited about. Um, and and one thing that I spoke to you the other week is it's so, it's something that you, uh, and you're going to do a super, super good job of explaining it, but how do you explain it to people? How, you know, because it is such an amazing experience that you it's it's hard to explain the magic of what actually goes on without being part of what goes on mm-hmm. so how, how would you See, explain it so the the interesting question of how do you describe a 747 gratitude experience the 90 minutes that we spend together trying to create a positive emotional transformation amongst our attendees is is really a lot of extra fluff time the real work mm. happens in a split second yeah. the real work of what we do happens the minute people hear the gratitude question mm. that we dive into at this experience this question came to us in July of 2015. Yeah. And at the period in our life, we were lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, insecure. I just come back from Italy after producing a Broadway play over there. And I felt like complete nothingness. And when I asked this question to the people at our dinner table, they came alive and so did I 
See, at that very first dinner, we asked this question. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, who would that be? And to summarize a 90-minute virtual experience, which used to be hours and hours and hours <laughs> conversing around the dinner table soon enough. Um, when people hear that question, two things happen. Their brain flickers out of control, dopamine and serotonin that is associated with positive memory bias goes fluttering and their breath goes, Oh, wow. Who have I never thought to thank a flood of emotion comes up. Mm. And those are emotions of regret, shame, guilt. How have I not thanked X, Y, Z? Mm. And it completely changes their life in the moment. Yeah. Now that is a very abbreviated description of our 747 gratitude experience, but it all transpires to that one moment. Yeah, which it's it's becomes it's a magical moment to try and uh, you know when you're actually living in it because you know we were talking about it the other week with someone and said you know how often do you sit with a group of friends your family strangers or whatever it is that question is is never asked who is someone that you are super grateful for that you have not been grateful for and you know like you said you really dig so you literally feel like you've got a shovel inside your body filtering through all these emotions and you're stirring everything up you're like oh my god what's happening here what the, this stuff that i'm thinking and feeling and then you get to that pinnacle point like bang it's it becomes you know such an engaging moment and everyone that i've spoken to after we did the session with um with with you and, and david a couple of weeks ago we're like fuck that just i didn't they were just like i'm i don't know what to say after that but it was amazing and it's, you know, it's all stuff that we just have within us. Gratitude is the, you know, gratitude is not a new thing. Gratitude has been around for many, many, many iterations in human history. I mean, it, gratitude goes back to the originations of social reciprocity amongst Rezus monkeys sharing food for grooming favors. And only recently has the science and psychology caught up to realize, wow, this isn't just the moral memory of mankind and the parent of all virtues. Mm -hmm. This is something scientifically proven for well-being. Yeah. And the thing is, we happen to live in a period of time in this world where great fear and great uncertainty, mm -hmm. tomorrow is not promised. No. And so often, especially amongst leaders like you and josh and your brother mark you you think so much about the future you know you got that vision board behind you that vision board is hope of what you can do tomorrow but as we know tomorrow is not promised in the middle of a global pandemic so the only way that you can overcome that fear and uncertainty is by taking a pause and reflecting on where we've come and gratitude is the tool to get us there because the past man it's already happened I control you it. can you can choose for it to have no power over you yes bad shit has happened to you yes good stuff has happened to you the grateful processing of pleasant and unpleasant memories helps you close the chapter on what's happened in order to give you the self-confidence and self-efficacy to know that you can get through anything in the future. And that's the amazing part that, you know, exactly like what you're describing, you can jump into all the bullshit from the past if you want, and you can try and plan this crazy future. But for that moment, you're sitting right here, yeah. right in this present moment, because like you said, tomorrow is not promised. And the stuff in the past that's happened, we can't, we can't change. Yeah. It is what it is. But looking at and that's another magical thing that you you know really get people to do is to be present and join this present moment and it, there's a lot of magic in that it's um 
you know, we're, we're, we're students of, uh, of positive psychology and the great father of positive psychology here in America is a man named Marty Martin Seligman that coming out of the university of Pennsylvania, a great, you know, often considered the, the fourth or fifth Ivy league school in America. And in positive psychology, there's only two things that have lasting benefits after a positive psychology micro intervention. That's mindfulness and gratitude. When yeah. you use the two hand in hand, literally you have lasting positive benefits. See, delivering positive emotions after getting through tough times from your past builds the durable personal resources for hope, optimism, self-confidence, self-efficacy. You develop pride in knowing that you can talk about the past like it doesn't have weight over you and you can get through it and you found connection with others in the process. Because when you acknowledge the benefit that you've received from others and you talk about it out loud in a small group format, you observe others doing the same and you realize you don't actually have that much disconnect from your fellow neighbor or friend. It's yeah. our uniquenesses and our differences that actually bring us together. And gratitude helps us find moments of serendipity. Yeah. And it opens up all those energy centers, you know, all your chakra centers open up when you are being truly aligned and truly honest to yourself, sitting in a present and being super grateful. Your body's like, oh my God, I am just so open to every experience in this moment. And it's, and it's something that's so fulfilling like you said before you know five or six years ago when it was when you came back from from italy and you were sitting there with no fulfillment and feeling a bit depressed and going through anxiety and then sitting into something like that just opens up a whole new level of of you know who the hell am i who is this person that i'm jumping into but that's something i really wanted to hear about was your life before this and then what inspired you you know because i know there's a good story behind of what you're doing and you're a very very busy man what were you doing before you were doing the 747 experiences and, and how did you get to this point? So my life has been nothing short of a, a confusing, non-linear blur. And I wouldn't trade it in for anything. Yeah. Because it, it got me here talking to you today and for that I'm grateful. But I, you know, I grew up in a bubble. I grew up in a, on a tiny island, on the East coast of the United States of America, a land known for its water and trees and nature and Southern and great food and African ancestors and a really good place to grow up. But because it was a, such a small island I was a larger than life character. I had creative outbursts. I had a lot of energy. I was always being seen. And so the elders in the community put Cal tranquilizing uh, Adderall ADHD medicine on me at the age of five. Wow. Now that's important to note because it took away my periphery they put blinders on me. You know, you ever seen a, a horse drawn carriage? They literally have yeah, blinders like yeah. on each side. So that's how I grew up. And, and I didn't, I didn't get removed from that, those shackles until I was 21 years old. Wow. And so my childhood, while nobody ever touched me or abused me or sold me or slaved me was one of great internal trauma and conflict because I couldn't let my dreams. I had no dreams. I didn't dream until I was 21. Yeah. Now I'm the biggest dreamer of all. And so you have to say that to say, I had so much internal conflict and strife bubbling up to the surface. How it manifested itself in my young adulthood was addiction, jail, suicide, rehab, depression, crying out for attention, spending too much money, crashing cars, all the habits that, that one would see upon the non-well-to-do. And that trauma led me on a voyage of self-discovery. I tried moving and living down on an iceberg in Patagonia. I tried 
living in Utah, the middle of the woods. I tried being a shrimp boat captain in South Carolina and leading kayak tours and all these kind of things. Yeah. And it wasn't until 2011 that some woman who was like a grandmother figure to me, her name was Mary Jean. She recently passed away. She looked at me and she said, I think it's time that you move to New York City. I said, all right, sounds good. No college degree, one suitcase, $8,000 in my pocket, living on my buddy's couch in Brooklyn. I made it to the Big Apple. Yeah. Not knowing what I was going to do, but I called up my dad and I said, dad, I think I want to be a, an actor. He said, all right, I don't know what that means, but here, talk to my friend, Tony. So he gave me this guy's <laughs> number who used to be this big famous actor. And I gave him a call and he said, Hey, I'm kind of retired. I'm not doing much. Why don't you come over and hang out Yeah. in that first meeting? We didn't even talk about acting. We just talked about life. Yeah. And after eight hours of wine and food and conversations about tattoos and regret and shame and all these kind of things, he said, why don't you come back next week? I'll pay you a couple dollars. You could be my assistant or whatever until you figure your, your stuff out. Yeah. And and so I be my first job in New York City was bitch work. Yeah. It was cleaning out closets and organizing scripts and driving this guy everywhere and doing that thing. Mm. Well, one day I picked up a, a script in his closet, a play that he had done in the mid 1980s. And it was a one-man show about Fiorello LaGuardia, the former mayor of New York City, LaGuardia Airport. When you come visit me, when you and Josh and Mark and Sweet Treats come in and uh, and, and uh, visit us. <laughs> when y'all come and visit us, you'll fly into, actually, you'll fly into JFK, but LaGuardia Airport. So the guy was the character. Yeah. And I said, I love the script. I said, we should do this play. He said, all right, I'll act in it. Him at the age of 74, I'll mm -hmm. act in it. You produce it. I didn't know what that meant, but as the theory goes in so many of our lives, we said yes. Mm -hmm. And that led to a life in show business. Yeah. And boy, oh boy, that career took us all over the world, inspiring and entertaining tens of millions of people re achieving the accolades that our peers would say that's a life well lived. Mm. But as you know, so well, just because something looks good on the inside doesn't mean it feels good in the heart. Yeah. And it's, it's because of that career that I learned how to walk and talk like a New Yorker. I learned yeah. how to negotiate. I learned how to take advantage of systems. I love learn how to serve an audience and be a man of and for the people. I learned that from Fiorello H. LaGuardia. And uh, that was right before the pasta sauce. Mm, wow, that's uh, there it is. Is it yes. pasta sauce? Yes, there it is. is it pasta sauce. We just got this in the mail last week. That's amazing. We can't wait to. I'm get gonna some work. There. Yeah, I'm gonna work with the. I'm gonna work with the group in in America to ship a a big a big uh, amount of it over to Australia. Absolutely. That'll make it and never no pasta dish is going to be the same unless you have that 747 sauce. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Life will not be the same without it. It's a magical so, experience. So that's a hell of a story. That is, and, and I mean, going through so much and, and, you know, we, we would, we just sort of loosely touched on before about finding your limits. You certainly push yourself to find your limits of of who you are and, and you know finding out who is chris shembra and trying everything like i love that it sounds there's so many similarities i have with my story like i finished high school and then there was no university degree but i had so many bloody jobs and tried everything and i'm still trying everything and i'm just you know but more I'm, now i'm probably more aligned with things that i love and things that yeah. are going to fulfill me and things that are going to fulfill other people but you know so so when you got back from doing all of that and having that experience, you had a real, there was a real dark turn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Italy, uh, Italy changed my life. 
Mm-hmm. You know, Italy, it was the food, it was the art, it was the culture, it was the love, it was the language, it was it's everything our, our yeah. ancestors know, right? Uh, and yeah. I, I felt called to do something more with my life. Mm-hmm. Somehow, the, the, all the theater stuff, the 14 Tonys, the seven, seven Emmys, the Grammys, all our plays have done all kinds of great stuff, but that was not enough. What did that mean? That wasn't something I touched with my hands. What's a man without his craft? Yeah. Right. At least you get to work with hammers all day. I mean, maybe now, now you're in the office because uh, you're running <laughs> your own company, but, but you, you're in a craft that you get to work with your hands. And I learned that from my grandfather and I crave that. My grandfather immigrated from Sicily in, in August 2nd, 1916. Yeah. And when he got here to America, he became a butcher. He yeah. worked with his hands. He got to cut the meat. He didn't even use a calculator. He did everything in his head. And he ended up retiring down to Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, where I was born and raised. And he got so bored in retirement that he went back to work part-time in, in the butcher shop in his 80s. Yeah. And, and years later, as I was interviewing for one of my first jobs anywhere, and it was in a restaurant, I was sitting with this uh, – executive chef, Mr. Lee, this native Islander, Gullah Islander. And I see over his shoulder, a photograph of him and my grandfather. I say, Mr. Lee, why do you have a photograph of my grandfather in your office? He said, I apprenticed under him at the local butcher shop and learned more about life watching the man, the way that man cut meat than I ever did before in my life. And so in that moment, I realized standing in the wings of the theater, watching the people have the impact. That was not enough. I needed to have my hands in this pasta sauce and be a man of and for the people like Fiorello H. LaGuardia and like Christopher Shembro, my grandfather. Mm. And it was then that I realized that the dinner table was my vehicle and the gratitude was my message. What better place to... Uh find gratitude and what better place to connect than you know at the dinner table and that's you know that's it's it's such a simple thing but we take such for granted like you know some of the best memories that i've got is is with you know one of my really good friends angela who you met on the gratitude session from the organic empire and yeah. we would sit at her house and she used to have this massive table and we would all sit around and just eat pasta and talk and laugh and have a few drinks and you know, I wouldn't trade that for anything. That is better than some of the best holidays that I've been in you know, in my entire life because that's being in the moment and that's exactly what you're giving people. And especially now through this global pandemic, there's so much depression, anxiety, fear, and people are looking for a way out. And, you know, something like this just opens so many doors for so many people. And, and I know that you've pivoted the business so, so well in this time. Like it's, it's exploded. It's probably been more amazing than, than ever because you can reach more people. You know, how have you seen people change through that experience? People who have got, you know, just going through depression or anxiety. How, how is this something like this changing? Yeah, the, um, the Surgeon General of the United States of America put out a statistic saying that 51% of the American workforce reports being lonely on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. It's it's equivalent to the reduction of lifespan of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, seven years off your life. That is what we're up against. See, we are inherently social creatures and we've somehow gone away from that. Mm -hmm. And I blame, I blame the great philosopher Descartes Mm -hmm. because Descartes, you know, we live in a Cartesian age mm. because of him of, I think, therefore I am. Yeah. And that ain't right. The, the Africans, they mm. do it so well. They have the Ubuntu philosophy of I am because we are. Yeah. And that philosophy is a communal perspective. And so that loneliness, that sense of isolation, that sense of unfulfillment. Look, we live in a world where we're constantly comparing ourselves to the success of others through social media, the fear of missing out. What are we going to be, right? We call it the great Western disease. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, an author by the name of Marshall Goldsmith says, 
you know, uh, well, I'll be happy when I get that next BMW. I'll be happy when I reach that next goal, that next promotion, that next, 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 that next never comes. No. Nah. We place so much value on what's happening outside of us and not enough value on what's happening in here. Mm -hmm. So we were fucked to begin with. And then, <laughs> and then, and then the, uh, the pandemic hit and now everybody's just, you know, strung out, but you know, I, I learned a very valuable lesson, a very inspiring lesson from a dear friend of mine, Cal Fussman. And I'll tell a brief four minute story and why that inspires me so much. Cal, many years ago, had one life goal interview Muhammad Ali for a sports periodical. Well, he did that at the age of 18. So now what's, what's he going to do for the what's rest next? of his yeah, life? Exactly. So he took a little bit of money and he sailed <laughs> off to Europe with one suitcase, a couple thousand dollars in his pocket, not even knowing what's going to happen. And he traveled around Europe. All of a sudden, the money ran out. But he still got passed around from family to family, from town to town, based on the kindness of strangers. And when he got back to America, boy, he had some stories to tell, right? So he started this column, very popular column for Esquire magazine, a very popular American periodical. And he ended up becoming editor-in-chief and all these kind of great things and a New York Times best-selling author with his column and all that kind of jazz. And one day, the publisher called him up and said, Cal, the money's starting to run out. It was 2008 financial crisis. The money's starting to run out. We can't send you physically all over the world to interview these great people, Mikhail Gorbachev, the Dalai Lama, all these kind of people. Can't do it. You're going to have to do it via computer. And he's like, via computer, boss, are you kidding me? This is never going to happen. I'll never be able to create that type of intimacy that I get from being across the table from someone in Timbuktu. <laughs> but then he realized you can actually create more intimacy than you could ever imagine. Yeah. See, instead of sitting across the the four foot desk from the president of Zimbabwe, he can now be face to face inches away, seeing the pimples on the forehead of the princess Sophia of Bulgaria. Mm. And I learned that from him. He's a great mentor of mine. And when COVID hit, I said, Oh my God, I feel the same way that I felt on July 15, 2015, lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, insecure. What are we going to do now? We can't stop serving the community. So we just started figuring it out. Yeah. Started inviting people to Zoom rooms, bringing in the principles of gratitude, treating them to a positive emotional transformation. And it just kind of took off because people actually need gratitude and empathy now more than ever. Yeah. And because of virtual, you're able to serve so many. Look at, look at us. I mean, come on, yeah. you're in, you're in Australia. Yeah. I'm in America and we're closer than ever. Absolutely. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm close. I'm sitting closer to you than Josh is sitting closer to you in, in that's your own true. room. Exactly. I know. That's a <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true. So that you must, you must, you must smell bad or something. Yeah, he does. I told him that in the room as well. And that maybe it's me that smells actually. Josh is looking at me like it's definitely me. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting. People are, um, as I mentioned, inherently social creatures. And this pandemic will hopefully give people an opportunity to pause, reflect, stop running so fast, mm. right? People, people ran so fast so much because they always felt like they had to do that next thing in order to get ahead. They felt Athlete. like they had to they had to post that next thing just to get more likes than the last photo. Yeah. And now that you can't do that, people mm. are re acknowledging what is valuable to them. The go slow, right? The two biggest winners, three biggest winners of COVID so far is sourdough bread, yeah. house plants, yeah. and puppies. Yeah, our puppies are huge. Yeah. 
that's that's a freaking good life yeah. a life built on plants and puppies and and baking bread yeah that's the meaning of life yeah right if, if we if if we go back over to are you from perugia where are you from uh um, abruzzo. abruzzo if we go back over to abruzzo and 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 we try to have a porchetta mm -hmm. it's going to take a long time to cook yeah. and odds are we're going to sit there and drink wine and talk about life and just like slow food, right? That's the region of uh, Emilia Romagna up in the north of Italy is slow food, fast cars. Yep. And that's what the pandemic taught me is that you can go slow and still accomplish great things. Uh, it's It's been an amazing time for going slow. And, and actually, you know, Steve Knapp, a good friend of both of ours, um, he kept saying to Mark and I, you know, and he's got these little turtles on his desk and every time we talk to him, he's like, don't forget the turtles. So Mark and I have actually gone out and bought ourselves these little crystal turtles to sit on our desk and there's days where I just sit with them in my hand and it's a reminder, go slow. You don't have to be rushing because if you are just rushing through things because you need to feel a sense of achievement, you're not doing anything. You're not helping, I'm not helping myself. I'm not helping, helping the people around me. I'm not giving the people around me the time that I need to be giving to them. So I just grab the turtle and I sit back in that moment and just let it, let those creative moments come to me because you miss them when you're just constantly fucking freaking out and constantly trying to be busy. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's a, um, it's a catch 22 though. You know, when you really think about what COVID's done is that, when you used to have to have two hours every day of commute to get to work and back, now you don't have that and people are using that time to work sometimes. Yeah. And so people are working longer hours. They're actually technically, statistically being more productive. What happened is a lot of companies have failed or done very bad because of COVID. But the others have done extremely well. This is the best thing to happen for a lot of companies across this planet because their people are just working longer hours. Mm. They don't have to get dressed to go into work to do this. So they're just like working all day. Mm. Well, that's going to rear its ugly head very soon. And so you really need to take the time. Like what you guys are doing for your community there in Australia Mm. I mean, it's the greatest thing you could do for humanity right now is give them the time to pause, reflect, and connect. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, taking taking that time. And one thing that I've never spoken to you about, which I'm really keen to hear, because the, um, I, you know, this is massive for me in my day to day life. I cannot live without it. Is meditation. And oh yeah, how often do you meditate, and how much of a role has this played in your life? Every day, twice a day. Yeah. Now I'll, I'll fail from time to time. Mm -hmm. I I'll be the first to acknowledge that everything we've talked about for the last 35 minutes. Yeah. I'm not, not the best at myself. Mm -hmm. See, gratitude is about progress, not perfection. Yep. And I slip mm -hmm. all the time, but meditation, what, what kind of meditation did you study? Uh, so I've studied a lot of the Dr. Joe Dispenza, meditations oh yeah 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 so opening the chakras and yeah that's and, and then so the meditations i do now i'll either do a silent meditation or i'll have um some chants on as i'm doing uh -huh. the meditation or sometimes a guided and the same thing i'll do twice hopefully if i get to it three times but mostly twice a day that'll oh, fail wow. but that's the fun part of being I, human right is is yeah i um i i have a um transcendental meditation practice yeah. which is the same practice that George Harrison uh, brought all the Beatles over mm -hmm. and studied in India. And then they brought it back to America and the it's a 20 minute twice a day yeah. month internal mantra based, the two syllable mantra. And it, it, once you turn on the mantra, dum, 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 dum. You go into pure, silent consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then you're there, and then you come back on, and you go on with your day. So my team on my calendar, they're not allowed to put any meetings over those two points in my day, 9 a.m. 
and 4.30 p.m. Oh, it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. It's absolutely life-changing, isn't it? To, to, I, used to, um, I used to sponsor, I used to sponsor um, sending some of my clients to go get, as a thank you to them, I'd bring them to go get trainings and transcendental meditation here in the city. Yeah. And I was in a meeting with one of them one day. His name's Anthony Tumbiolo. He's actually outlined in uh, one of the chapters in my book. And he said, uh, I, I was in a meeting with him and his assistant came in and he said, boss, I got to take you. It's time for you to meditate. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, holy crap, this is awesome. I just got kicked out of a meeting so that he could meditate. And I'm the one that got him into meditation. This is great. Yeah. Absolutely. Josh, can you write down Transcendental Meditation? We're going to study that. Oh, yes. Life changer. You just look up Transcendental Meditation and Jerry Seinfeld. Transcendental Meditation and The Beatles. Transcendental Meditation and, oh, my gosh. So um, what do you say to people who, who, who say, you know what, meditation is just not for me. I just can't do it. And, I, you know, it's not going to change. It's just bullshit. What, what do you say? I said the same thing. Yeah. I have an act. I have an active brain. Mm -hmm. We have anxiety. Yeah. It's really hard to calm it down. But if you go to get the, as everything in life, you got to go to the right coach, yeah. the right teacher. And sometimes it's going to take a lot of different coaches in order to find the right one. Mm. And it's scientifically proven yeah. to rewire your brain mm. to focus and be more creative and be more resilient and everything. It's the same thing as gratitude in positive psychology. It's literally scientifically proven. That's what I love uh, about uh, all the teachings from, from Dr. Joe Dispenza. I don't know if you, you get into him at all, but everything that he does he's proving it scientifically he's, he's yeah. showing us the spiritual part and he's saying well here's the scientific fact behind this that it does work that it opens you know that's creating all these dopamines that it's opening channels in your heart your heart is actually expanding when you're in this moment look it's it's i don't know it's it's magical really to be in that sort of a place it's um you can't describe it you mm. when you do meditation right you you kind of tune out the rest of the world and you go into this hidden sunken far away place in your mind and it's just peaceful mm. and then all of a sudden you start coming back and it's like you slept for 10 hours yeah it's amazing oh yeah. it's unbelievable yeah we've uh, mark and i did a um, dimensional mind approach session with with steve knapp and that was i think it was an eight or a ten week session and the same thing was brilliant and they're all guided sessions and some of the meditations in there where you go in there specifically for the purpose of recharging and it feels like you've just had four or five hours deep sleep and you come out pumped i accidentally did it at night time once i didn't realize what the meditation was so i was laying in bed doing it and then i came out of like oh fuck I can't sleep now. So I had a super, super <laughs> restless sleep for the whole night. So I, now I know not to do that one at night time. But it's, you know, it's funny. The, the journeys that they take you on are, are amazing. And then being around the sort of people you can connect with and talk to that. And I'm the sort of person that once I'm onto that sort of stuff, I want to shovel it down people's throats. Like, Come on, you've got to do this. It's going to change your fucking life. Let's go. And it's, I find hard to hold that restraint by not, you know, the same with the gratitude sessions. I'm running around telling everyone about how amazing these gratitude sessions are. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. So it's, you know, once I get excited about stuff, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to stop me. And I imagine you're very much the same. Oh yeah. That's why I have David to reel me in. <laughs> oh my gosh. And our team, I mean, like we've got people on our team that are the yes people. And then we've got people on our team that are the careful people. And we've got people on our team that are like the no people. Mm -hmm. David is a good, careful reiner in, yeah. Chris, is that what you need to be doing? I don't know. Let me, mm. let me, you know, so it's a, it's a good thing. Diplomatically. Oh yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so one really important question that we ask everyone, what is your favorite pasta? <laughs> what is my favorite pasta? 
I'd say. Or your dip, favorite so pasta dish. I'd say I'd say carbonara. Really? Oh yeah. We oh, yeah. haven't had a carbonara yet, have we, Josh? We've had a lot of lasagna. We've had a lot of gnocchi. We've I mean, I'd I'd say, a it it has to do with my love affair mm-hmm. with Rome. Yeah. Right. If you study, if you study the food of Rome, the the basics of everything they do in Rome is cacio mm-hmm. or a, a specific type of goat's milk cheese, yeah. uh, sheep, sheep's milk cheese, um, which is like a pecorino. Mm-hmm. But from cacio, you have pecorino romano. From that, you add pasta and pepper, and you have cacio e pepe. Mm-hmm. From there, you add a little stuff, and you've got pasta a la gricia. Mm-hmm. From there, you add a little stuff, and you've got pasta a la matraciana. And then from there, you add stuff and you've got carbonara. So carbonara, when done right, is my favorite thing. When I was in Italy, just at the start of, co- I landed in Italy. I landed from Italy in the midst of the pandemic. Wow. I don't know why they let me back in the country, but I was over there because you know Italy changed my life. And so when we wrote our book, Gratitude and Pasta: The Secret Sauce for Human Connection, I decided to grab my dad, grab my book. And let's go show Italy what we did. Mm-hmm. And so we brought the book to Rome. Mm-hmm. And I spent a week and a half walking around, literally studying everybody's different version of Carbonara. Yeah. Amazing. And, and so you'll see some people doing it still with spaghetti. Mm-hmm. Some people doing it with bucatini. Mm-hmm. Some people now doing it with now the popular kids in Trastevere are doing it with rigatoni, but we're wow. talking about like oh yeah 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 dude the like That's the artistic mm. the artistic modern young people way of carbonara is with rigatoni. That's like with the the like gastronomy stuff deconstructed carbonara. Oh my! So like, what is carbonara? Carbonara is egg yolk, mm-hmm. pecorino. Romano, yep. pepper, yeah. pasta, yeah. guanciale. Mm-hmm. That's it. Don't mm-hmm. fucking add cream. Don't, Don't add cream. Cheese. Oh it's, my yeah. god. Yeah, it's so, horrible. Uh, but the deconstructed carbonara is the next gastronomic adventure I'm going to go on. But yeah, favorite pasta is probably carbonara. Mm. Well, this has been fun. It's been amazing having you. And what, one quick question: What is next for uh, 747? Gratitude and pasta launching into so, the stratosphere. So you are hearing it first. Our um, next book will launch on April 7th, 2022. Yeah. And it'll be more of a thought leadership piece around gratitude yeah. and less of a focus on experiences. Mm-hmm. So when we look at our business, we know that experiences are experiences. I mean, a company could buy a hundred experiences from us a year and we'll have a great year with that company. But what's even bigger is if we can scale gratitude. And the only way we can scale gratitude is making it more accessible to the people. So the next book that we're going to come out with is on how gratitude shows up in popular culture, media, technology, society, celebrity, leadership business whatever yeah. um so we'll be translating the research of these great academic institutions robert emmons barbara frederickson marty seligman and translating them into kind of modern language um, Amazing. and the first so book that was fantastic so i'm sure that the second book's gonna be even better first book was great but we haven't again we we haven't even begun i mean we're excited. You know, our, our pandemic is the greatest thing that's ever happened to our company. Yeah. Uh, we'll grow probably 50% this year. Um, so that's we're amazing. having a great, 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 great year. We just hit a huge milestone this morning. And uh, now we're just going to the next thing. Fantastic. Congratulations. And the uh, book Thank Gratitude you. and Pastor is available pretty much everywhere. I ordered a copy and it came within 
10 days and it was oh really, yeah oh really yeah good good easy read with a lot of amazing stories so um thank chris you, shimbra the man the gratitude man thank you very much for being on the show thank you for having me buddy